Good morning, New Life Power. We want to welcome you into the house of the Lord this morning. So great to see your bright and shiny faces on this gloomy, rainy Sunday morning. Your faces look awesome. But uh, we just want to welcome you in. I encourage you to get settled in, get your kids checked in. The kids on once again for joining us uh, for the start of the worship service. And we also want to give a hearty welcome to those joining us online. I do see you. But uh, my name is Jason. Looking forward to seeing you guys. Good morning, everybody. Who's ready to worship this morning? I know I am. You guys didn't know it, but you're invited today as the first day of our all-church choir practice. So let's all stand up and sing. Today's a little different. I gave the band the day off so we all can hear ourselves sing. No, that's a joke. That's a joke. All right, so let's all sing together. Here we go, sing with me. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with a sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. 
and nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Great is your love and justice, God of Jacob. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in a song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. Here we go. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. So remember, so remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough, heaven reaches out to us, your grace is enough for me. God, I sing your grace is enough. I'm covered in your love. Your grace is enough for me. For me. Amen. That was awesome. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Oh, everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Savior, He can move the mountains. My 
God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Forever, author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what I think you're like, but I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night. You tell me that you're pleased and that I am never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Oh, I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide cause you know just what we need before we can say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who I am, your good, good Father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. It's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You 
are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Oh, love, so undeniable, I can hardly speak. Peace so unexplainable, I, I can hardly think as you call, deeper still as you call, deeper still as you call, deeper still into love, 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 your good, good fun. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. It's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Let's sing that one more time. You are perfect in all your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to release all the kiddos back to the kid zone. You guys can go. Communion, communion which we are about to celebrate, it's a time of remembrance for, because of the ultimate sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He paid that ultimate sacrifice as a ransom for whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus himself established this time of remembrance. On a night during the Last Supper with his disciples, he took bread after he had given thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for you. Communion is a time of remembrance for everyone who has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. If you are a child of God, you are welcome to participate with us. If you have not yet trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you need to enter into that personal relationship with him before you can participate in a communion service. The Apostle Paul does warn us not to take this celebration too casually. He said we ought to examine ourselves. We ought to examine ourselves. So take this time to examine your hearts in the quietness of your hearts. Confess it before God, for he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and restore us from all unrighteousness. As the ushers come forward to distribute the elements of the bread and cup, bring it before God and seek his forgiveness. Let us pray. Heavenly gracious Father, we thank you so much for your son Jesus Christ and the ultimate sacrifice he paid on the cross for us. We thank you for this communion time and the time of remembrance of what he has done 
for us, Father. Um, he lived a life uh, to show us an example. He died as a ransom for us, Father. Um, he was buried, but he rose again. And we look forward to his return. We thank you, Father, for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. King of 
So one of the uh, New Life staff guys, uh, location pastors, circulated a headline that caught his attention this week. And uh, it simply read, uh, Missing Woman or the Missing Woman Mystery Solved. And uh, you see it there, but I'm going to read it for you because you're, most of your eyesight's not going to get you that far. It says, A group of tourists spent hours Saturday night looking for a missing woman near Iceland's Elja Canyon, only to find her among the search party. I think that's the common reaction. How did that happen? The group was traveling through Iceland on a tour bus and stopped near a volcanic canyon. Soon there was word of a missing passenger. The woman who had changed her clothes didn't recognize the description of herself and joined the search. The search was called off about 3 a.m. when it became clear that the missing woman was in fact accounted for and searching for herself. It gave me pause, and I wondered, how often do we find ourselves searching for ourselves? <laughs> Ever had that experience? It's like, I'm lost. I don't know where I am. I, or you don't know you're lost, and what you're looking for is some expression of who you think you are or want to be. Interesting headlines. As a news commentator might say, moving on to other headlines, it's almost every week that we hear of some regulation, whether new or old, that deals with the protection of our environment, that, that deals with regulations that address the pollutants that so often plague our society or our, our country. This this, uh, we still live in the, you know, the hinterland of Illinois, and so, um, and though it's the same news you get here, so for months you've been hearing about this corporation in Willowbrook, Illinois, that has been accused of releasing cancer-causing uh, pollutants into the environment, sterogenics. And, uh, and then not too long ago, ArcelorMetal and their Burns Harbor plant was accused of dumping pollutants into Lake Michigan. About the middle of last week, there was a f Korean freighter that capsized off the eastern coast of uh, Georgia. And they were concerned about the oil that was spilling into the Atlantic. Uh, a little later last week, there was a derailment of a train near, in southern Illinois, and, and it caught fire, and there were these plumes of black smoke that, that were full of toxic chemicals, and so residents in the area had to be evacuated. All of that kind of stuff impacts our environment, and there are regulations that, that seek to control that, seek to help manage that. Uh, you have, if you have uh, an iPhone with a, or a, a smartphone with a weather app, it probably includes for you some indication of the air quality for the day. Not that you can do anything about it, but it does tell you whether or not you can take a deep breath if you go outside, you know. And so there are these, these things that are designed to encourage us, to help us, to protect us, if you will. And we're relieved when uh, news reports deal with someplace else, aren't we? I wonder, well, you know, kind of another illustration of that we encounter uh, that kind of regulation every time you get your notice from the, the DMV or whoever sends it out here in Illinois with regard to your auto emission testing and you take it in and you hope that it passes and if not, you got a certain amount of time to bring it into compliance with the Clean Air Act and, and all that kind of stuff. I, I wonder if you've ever wondered what it would be like to have regulations that would govern the pollution of our soul, of our heart, our mind, our mouth. Now, I'm not advocating for that kind of external system because it would simply turn into an expression of, of legalism. Um, 
And Colossians chapter 2, verse 23 tells us, such regulations indeed have the appearance of wisdom. They look like they're for our good with their self-imposed worship and false humility and their harsh treatment of the body. But listen to this. They lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. And so Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, you're familiar with this. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's that which takes place from the inside out. It's the, it's the metamorphosis, the, the transition from inside to outside that God is concerned about. Is that me? Don't know. All right, we'll keep going until we get that figured out. And uh, Josh wants me to get my speaker thing out of my back pocket. There we go. It's so comfortable there, Josh. I don't know. It's... All right, we'll try that. All right. And so we, uh, so hopefully you can hear without the, the static going on. <clears throat> but the, the Phillips translation takes Romans 12 too, and it, and it puts it this way. Uh, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. The reality is the church can squeeze you into a mold too. The problem is when we are squeezed into a mold and it's externally induced, it doesn't change the heart. It just changed the appearance of being different. And so, so God's solution to that is not by by changing just the external, he says, look, the external indeed needs to change. What we do, what we say, how we behave does need to change, but it needs to be motivated by what's going on in the heart. And so God is concerned that we start out with this, this transition that takes place from the inside out. But while we're cleaning up the air that we breathe, it seems like our souls are becoming increasingly polluted, doesn't it? And Satan knows that a, a dirty life is going to be a useless tool in the hand of God and for the development of his kingdom. I may have used this illustration before, but I think it's apropos. So yesterday, you're out mowing your lawn. It's a hot, humid day. You come in, you need a drink of water. You look at the kitchen sink, and there's, there's two glasses sitting on the counter right by the sink. One is, is still got milk residue from breakfast in it. And the other just came out of the dishwasher. Now let me ask you a question. Which of those glasses are you going to fill with water to quench your thirst? You say, well, Pastor, that's an easy answer. That's, I'm going to take the clean one. I don't mean any irreverence by this or no disrespect, but don't you think God is at least as smart as you are? Why is God going to risk the success of his kingdom over using something that's dirty? God wants a purity of life. God wants a purity of heart. God wants a purity of mind. When we say that we're committed to being a family of love, that it cooperates with God in making fully devoted, fruitful followers of Jesus Christ, we're committed to the expansion of God's kingdom. We're committed to sharing the good news of the gospel so that people will... will experience this life transformation that takes them from death to life, from darkness to light. But we cannot be of use to God in that process, that eternal difference-making process, when our lives are not clean vessels for him. And so in Peter's writing to the, his audience all across Asia Minor, he, he has a word for them. If you open your Bible, you're looking at the text, probably even on, on your electronic version of that, there's a heading, just two simple words, be holy. 
There at chapter 1, verse 13 and following. It goes beyond just the personal issue, too. Because sin in the lives of believers can cripple the body of Christ. It can cripple us collectively in our commitment to be kingdom builders for the glory of God. You remember, probably, don't you, the, uh, the Old Testament account of, of, Jericho, of Israel's defeat of Jericho. And the, and the miraculous involvement of God. And as the first city conquered in the promised land, God says, look, the, the spoils here are mine. And so everybody was forbidden from taking that which would have been theirs in a normal battle situation, the, the spoils of war, if you will. And they were to be devoted to God. They were not to take any of those spoils. But a guy named Achan did. And he disobeyed. His desire for what he saw led to disobedience. And his disobedience led to defeat of the Israeli army and the death of 36 soldiers when they went up against this little city of Ai. What rendered that army ineffective? It was sin in the camp. More about that story in Joshua chapter 7 if you want to check out the context for yourself. But that can happen to us in the church today. We're we're part of God's army. We suffered defeat. We, We failed to move towards our kingdom purposes because of sin in the camp. And whether it's personal or between people, the reality is God's not going to use dirty instruments to accomplish his purposes. And in part of the, the value, or in part that's the value of our, our self-examination. Uh, Eduardo just led us through a, a time of examination before we took the Lord's table. I, I love the opportunity that we celebrate the Lord's table every week because it gives us at least that time to stop and think, God, is there anything that interrupts me in my relationship with you? And according to the instructions in 1 Corinthians 11, it tells us that we're to examine our horizontal relationships as well. Is there any relationship that I have horizontally that is keeping me from experiencing the blessing of God in my life and my being a useful instrument in moving forward? And so we need these times of both personal and congregational examination. Communion provides that. Days of fasting and prayer provide that. Keeping our relationship with God right and uh, or right with Him and then right with one another. And so God is simply making a point. It's a very simple point. It is simply that we are to be holy. And you're going, oh man, now the pastor wants me to be a holy roller. (laughs) No, I don't want you to be a holy roller. I really want you to be holy. Because God really wants you to be holy. It's not about the external behaviors that give the the delusion of, of setting yourself as a weirdo apart from the rest of the world. That's not what God wants. He wants you to be and to act like Him. And He is holy. It's not an exclusive application to being holy, but there's certainly um, a predominant and pertinent to our society the fact that, that holiness includes moral purity. Consider 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. It is God's will that you be sanctified. It's that theological word that simply means that we are to be set apart, that we are to be holy, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each one of you should learn how to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Drop down to verse 7 in that chapter, and it says, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Now, it's great news, because whatever God mandates of us, he also provides the means for us to experience 
And so in our text today, we're, we're looking at, at five motives for staying pure in our life before God, staying pure even as we are residents in a polluted world, seeking to answer the question, how in the world do we stay pure when the world all around us is filthy, is polluted, is committed to living ways that God doesn't want, that doesn't honor God? And the first of those is by our focus on the glory of God. It becomes the, the, the primary motive for us. So, so if you're following along in a text, look with me at chapter 1, verse 13. And we, we see here that as our text begins, therefore prepare your heart for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace that is given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Jesus Christ is coming back again. And when he does, he will be revealed in glory. When Jesus came the first time, the angels declared glory to God in the highest. When he comes back again, his glory is going to be revealed to all the earth. So when Jesus was here, he says to his disciples in Mark chapter 13, verse 26, at that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. God's glory is, is not just one more of those attributes or characteristics that we know about him. It's, it's the sum total of all that God is and all that God does. You see, the reality is purity points us to who God is. It points other people to who God is. And that purity begins in our minds. We're told in verse 13 to prepare our minds for action, to be self-controlled, to set your hope. That is, we're to have disciplined minds, not letting them run wherever they want, not letting them to run wild. Christians, we're told by the Apostle Paul, are to take every thought captive to Christ. Make it obedient to Christ. And if we don't have control over our thoughts, you'll find that your thoughts will control you. When we center our thoughts on the return of Jesus Christ and live accordingly with that expectation that because, because Jesus could return any time, and indeed he can, when that's our expectation, when that's the way that we live, then are we switching something out here? Or? All right. Now you're going to make me stand still. All right, we'll see how that works. You shut me off back here? All right. When we find ourselves focused on the return of the Lord Jesus as a reality that could take place any day, it'll change the way we live. It shouldn't change the fulfillment of our responsibilities. We don't sell all that we have. We don't go sit on our rooftops and look at the clouds. We don't because by God's wisdom and grace, we ought to live with a sense of, of contentment and satisfaction and purpose, continuing to do what he's given us to do. That's what brings glory to him. But we do it with a mindset that, that at the end of this day, I could be in the presence of God because he's come for me. And whether it's by, as I had an old mentor say, whether it's by the undertaker or the uppertaker, um, us 
is the same. And we need to live with the reality that that could happen any moment. The news is full of those occasions, aren't there? When, when somebody, young people, middle adults, their life is snuffed out. They're gone. It's not a surprise to God, but it's often a surprise to us. God doesn't want us to live so that our death is a surprise. The book of Hebrews tells us that we're looking unto Jesus. You remember the, the occasion with Lot, with Abraham and his nephew Lot, and their herds were too big to, for the land to support, and so Abraham says to his nephew, well, lift up your eyes and just look at, look at whatever part and parcel of land that you want, and you go there, and I'll go the other way, and, and then our herdsmen won't be fighting, and there will be enough land for everybody. And, and so it says in, in Genesis that Lot lift up, he lifted up his eyes, and he looked towards the plains of Jericho, and it was a lush and prosperous area. And he chose that for himself. And then he ultimately ends up pitching his tents towards Sodom. And then he ends up living in Sodom. And we all know what ultimately happened to Sodom. And Abraham, on the other hand, we read in Hebrews, set his eyes looking for a city above different perspective, different life goals, different agenda. And so while Abraham is, has his vision set on that heavenly city, Lot is settling for Sodom, and, and Abraham we find living by faith, and Sodom we find, or Lot we find living by sight, and, and Abraham receives the blessing of obedience, and Lot ends up losing it all. Because his eyes were set on the wrong things. Listen to how the Apostle John puts it. He says, dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. So the first motivator to pure living is the glory of God. The second is the holiness of God. The holiness of God has to do with the, the impact on our lives as obedient children we read. And, and, and typically... Children are going to look and act like their parents. It's almost kind of the default DNA mode, isn't it? And, and so somebody looks at a kid on the playground and says, I bet I tell you who your parents are. Why? Because there's this resemblance. Or you, you listen to them for a little bit and it's like, oh, that sounds like Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, you know, because the kids end up talking like mom and dad. And I think I've told you, you know, so often at the Mission Academy, people would see my dad and I walking down the hallway, and, and they'd say, oh, it goes Pete and repeat. You know, it's like, because we, we just have that same kind of gait, that same kind of, of stride, that same kind of bearing. It, it comes naturally. And so when we're children of God, then we need to look like our Father. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, it tells us that we're to be imitators of God as dearly loved children. How we live comes from who we are. And maybe as a parent you've said to your children or you had your parents say to you in your growing up years, in your being trained years, well, this is what we do because we're a Smith or Jones or Goody or Baker or whatever your last name was. Or maybe you heard your parents chastise you. No, we don't do that because we're so-and-sos, right? Had lunch with a brother this week, and he was telling me about a conversation he'd had with his son. And, uh, and his son said something about hating somebody. And, 
And he looks at him and goes, son, we didn't teach you to hate. That's not, that's not part of our family culture. You know, not who we are. And so it is when we do what God's called us to do. Uh, the root word for holy is the, comes from a concept of being different because of who we are as the children of God. We will be, at least we should be, different than the world, different than those who, who we used to be like before we were born again, different than those who we were when we, as the text says, lived in ignorance. We didn't know any better. And then because holiness is an essential part of, of God's nature, as his children, it's to be an essential part of our nature. God tells us that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Next chapter in 1 Peter tells us that you're, you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You're God's special possession. You may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into wonderful light. Go back to 1 John, and it tells us that we are to walk in the light as he is in the light. Have that fellowship with him. That's what it means to be holy in a practical way, in a day-to-day -day way. It's, it's doing what Jesus would do. We, we demonstrate that in the way that we live. We model that for others in the way that we live. We become Jesus to people around us. There's a third motivator for purity. It's, it's the word of God. Verse 16 says, as it is written, as it is written, as it is written, be holy, because I am holy. Because God is God, it should be enough for us that we take him at his word. When he says something, that ought to settle the debates for us. It's, it's amazing to me how much energy gets invested on the part of our, us as human beings talking our way around the word of God, finding some loophole that justifies our disobedience, our not doing what God says. But it's been our human propensity all the way back to the Garden of Eden where we doubted God's word and where we denied God's word and where we disobeyed God's word. And so we come by it naturally, don't we? It's just that it's the father of the flesh, not our heavenly father who we follow at that point. But watch closely here, because not only is the word of God the motive for our purity, it's also the method for our purity. Um, many of us memorized Psalm 119.9 uh, early on in our life, right? How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. Then note how God's word becomes that instrument in our purity. Just three quick things. It's, it, it has a role to play in our salvation, our regeneration, our being born again. It's through the word of God. For you have been born again, not through perishable seed, verse 23, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. And it brings to mind Romans chapter 10, verse 17, doesn't it? There it says that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ, the word of God. And then there's the, the part of sanctifying, the replacement, the change that goes on in our life, this sanctifying process that rids us of the things that Peter talks about in chapter 2, verse 1. It rids us of the toxic stuff, the malice, the deceit, the hypocrisy, the slander, the envy. And it replaces it with the truth of God's word. Now that takes time in our lives. It's not going to, for most of us, be instantaneous. So it's why God tells us to feed on his word. And we find in our maturing process that just like it says in chapter 2, verse 2, it starts out as the pure milk of the word. 
And then we find the word of God described as bread and as meat and as honey. It's a, it's a diet for maturity, isn't it, that grows up. At least that's God's intent. The writer of Hebrews kind of gets on to those to whom he's writing in the end of chapter 5, and he says, look, I ought to be able to write to you as mature individuals. Instead, I'm having to feed you with pablum. I'm having to put formula back in a bottle for crying out loud. You ought to be cutting the steak by now. You know, kind of the goody paraphrase, but uh, you get the idea. It's like grow up. Take in a diet that's going to help you mature. And so there's this, this regeneration and then replacement as, as the, the process goes on. And we begin, as we see there in chapter 2, verse 2, as a newborn baby. But the goal is to become, in the words of the Apostle Paul, a, a pure bride, a fully mature individual who is then wed to Christ. So Paul writes in Ephesians 5, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And then there's the refinement that follows that. Refinement that comes by obedience to God's word. So verse 2 continues, So by it, that is by the word, you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. This refinement is, is this maturing process that God has all of us in, growing up. Salvation doesn't mean that you've arrived. It's not the last step that you take. It simply means that you have taken a life uh, defining, a eternity defining, a destiny defining next step in your journey. But the journey continues after your salvation. You're not just satisfied being born. You want to grow up. You want to become mature. You want to become a re reproductive a citizen in the kingdom of God. That's what disciple-making is all about. And Philippians 1.6 reminds us that God is, Paul writes, he says, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Let's go back to chapter 1, verse 17. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live out, live lives as strangers here in reverent fear. And we find another motivator. The fourth motivator for purity in our lives is the judgment of God. We like to talk about love and mercy and kindness, forgiveness. And rightfully so. Those are precious qualities of God that have direct and important impact in our life. But they're not the only qualities of God. And to proclaim the full counsel of God, to understand who God fully is, we need to understand that he is also a God of holiness and justice. God will not, God cannot wink at sin. Think about this for a minute. Sin cost God the life of his son, his one and only son. And he died became separated from his father for the first time in all of eternity. That's the seriousness of sin. Now, 
And God gives us an opportunity to repent of our sin. And he freely forgives our sin. But don't ever let anybody tell you that your salvation is free. It's free to you. It's a free gift. But it costs dearly. Because sin had to be judged. And so we see that sin is always costly. It deserves judgment. Accurately, sin is not free, as I've just said. It's, it's a matter of carrying this huge price of death. It's costly. I think there's another reality that sometimes we don't often connect to our sin experience, and that is when we become children of God and then perhaps lapse back into a life that we used to know, and we, we think to ourselves perhaps in the midst of that, you know, I, I used to, I used to have a, a great time running around. I used to have a great time doing what I used to do, and, and now when I go do that, I... It, it, it's, in fact, it's not fun at all. It's, it's, it's kind of bothersome. In fact, I, I get these, these pent-up emotions inside. I, I feel terrible. It's, it's like I want to just go home and sleep, you know. I get depressed. It's, you know what's going on? God is not going to allow his children to enjoy sin. Now, a couple of things can happen. You can do that so long that you quench the Spirit of God in your life and, and silence him, if you will. Or perhaps you need to wonder whether you were ever a child of God. If you're still having a good time sinning, that's incompatible with being a child of God. It's not that we don't sin. But the longer that we're children of God, we ought to not be sinless, but we ought to sin less, as you've heard me say. And so there's this convicting that comes when we step outside the light and our fellowship with him is broken. And so sin is costly and it is convicting. And, and then uh, the, the fear of the Lord, this judgment of God is, is corrective. Uh, there's a definition that I like of the fear of the Lord that simply says it's, it's the constant awareness that God is always seeing and evaluating all that I think and say and do. It's living with that awareness of God's constant evaluation of our lives. Some of you have read or seen the movies from C.S. Lewis's uh, Chronicles of Narnia. And you remember, if you are familiar with the story, that when the children go through the closet and end up in Narnia, they find their way to the home of the beavers. And they're telling them a little bit of the history of, of uh, Narnia and then the coming of the winter witch and, or the queen of the winter and, and, and how hard life has been under her rule and and, but there's hope because Aslan, this lion, is reported to be coming back again. And so they begin to tell the children about Aslan, this, this lion, this mighty beast, the, the king of the jungle. And one of the little kids says, well, is, is Aslan safe? <laughs> and Mr. Beaver goes, safe? No, he's not safe but he is good. And that's what we need to remember when we're tempted to sin and thumb our nose at the love of God. It's not safe to do that. But God always always, always, always will meet us if we will confess our sin. 
he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins. But the God of judgment is not just a God of the Old Testament. Don't let anybody ever tell you that. God never, ever changes. And the same wrath and judgment and seriousness with which God displays his character against sin in the Old Testament is true for us that live in a New Testament age as well. God hates sin. And he gave his son to resolve the damage that it would do in our lives. And he does not take that cost lightly. And we cannot afford to either. And so, all of this is costly and convicting and corrective. And then one more motive. Fifth motivator for purity in our life. Because God is good. And it's his love. The greatest expression of God's love is that he saves us. That which for us is unearned, it is undeserved, it is unequaled. It's an evidence of his grace and his mercy and his patience, his goodness. So the Apostle John says the great, greater love has no one than this, or he's quoting the words of the Lord Jesus, that he lay down his life for his friends. And we know that Jesus didn't just die for his friends. He died for us while we were enemies of his. Paul says in Romans 5.8, but God demonstrated his own love for, this, for us in this, that he, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that salvation then for us involves a great price. That's what it says in verse 19. It's the precious blood of Jesus and it involves this great plan. Verse 20, it's originated before the creation of the world. God knew everything that was going to happen. Adam and Eve's sin did not catch him by surprise. Satan's fall did not catch him by surprise. The damage that Satan has done in this world has not caught God by surprise. And God has a plan to fix it. And a huge part of that plan, the hinge pin of that plan, was the death of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that allowed the penalty for sin to be paid so that we could be restored in our relationship with God as he intended it to be. And then live out according to that purpose, verse 18, to replace our slavery, our redemption. It says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let your sin, yourselves be burdened again with the yoke of slavery. To replace the slavery with freedom and then to replace the emptiness of life. Peter says, the empty way of life that was handed down to you from your forefathers. He says, I, I, I want to replace that for you with, with fullness, the John 10.10 10 kind of life that Jesus promised, that you might know it abundantly, have life and have it abundantly, this full and meaningful life. The only appropriate response to that kind of love, I think, is to love God back, don't you? And John tells us that we love him because he first loved us. It's not anything that we can manufacture on our own. It's something we continue to grow in. But our love, like our worship, is a response to God. 
And the only re appropriate response that there is is to love him back. And, and you, you look through the pages of Scripture, you say, well, okay, so how am I supposed to love God? And Jesus said there's two ways, two primary ways. He says, you do what I say. You obey me. And part of that obedience is the second way. It's loving other people. By this all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And when we fail to love one another as ornery as somebody else may be, we're saying, God, I know better than you. And God doesn't agree with you. You don't know better than him. And you're much wiser just to, just to agree with him. And then invite him to live his life through you. Then he sets you free. That's God's call on your life. It's God's call to you this morning that gets reflected ultimately in purity. And so when, when you hear God's command to be holy like he is holy, maybe you throw up your hands and you go, I, I can't do that. It's beyond my capacity. I, there's no way that I could ever measure up. And God goes, that's true. And so let me live my life through you. In fact, the Apostle Paul agreed with you with the same level of frustration and maybe even more. Check it out, Romans chapter 7. The things that I want to do, I, I can't do. The things that I don't want to do, I do. You know, woe is me, he says. Who's going to deliver me? And I love the end of that chapter, in the beginning of chapter 8, that says, thanks be to God. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you let Jesus live his life through you. It's the answer. It's why... It's why the Christian life is the Christ life. You know, Christian just means little Christ. Christians were first called that in a derogatory meaning. Ah, you guys just think you're a little Jesus. And they picked up on it and said, yep, that's who we are. Because Jesus is living through me what it is to be a Christian and it's how we experience the purity that God is calling us to remember God never mandates for you what he doesn't always already provide the means to accomplish and that's that's equally true for our personal purity and holiness as it is for us as a congregation and he has given us the means of his indwelling spirit and also the motivation to pursue this purity because of the glory of God and the holiness of God and the word of God the judgment of God and the love of God and when we understand these things about God and you actively and aggressively seek to live a pure and holy life of obedience that will identify you as a child of God, then you're living what God has called you to live. Sexual sin is particularly rampant in our society today. It's made its way into the church with all kinds of justification. But it's not the only sin that derails us in our purity. It's not the only sin that derails us in representing who God's called us to be. So whatever it is that diminishes the glory of God in and through our lives, derails us from being all that God has intended us to be. And for that, God has given us a solution. Our response 
It's a response of confession. It's a response of cleansing. And it's a response of compliance. Our saying yes to God and his control in our lives. It's the way in which we'll find ourselves conforming our lives to God's way, to God's will that ultimately brings the greatest sense of satisfaction and fulfillment and enjoyment because it's the way God designed us to live. So the worship team is going to come, and, and they're going to sing, and it's an opportunity for you to respond to what the Spirit of God may have been saying to you this morning. Would you listen to him? Would you give him the freedom of an open and responsive and yielded heart? And if there's an issue that surfaces that you'd like to have prayed for, then our elders and spouses and uh, small group leaders and their spouses are simply going to station themselves around the worship center. and, and, And you're welcome to go and just... Tell them what you need prayer for. This is not a counseling session. This isn't a life stories time. This is, this is how I need prayer. And allow one of our spiritual leaders, our shepherds, to love on you in the presence of God. Maybe what you'd get prayed for this morning doesn't have anything to do with what you've heard said. But this is your time before God. And we invite you to take the opportunity. Father God, you know the heart of every person here. You know exactly where we stand before you. You know what it is that has been proclaimed this morning that would have application to each of our hearts. And by your spirit, would you drive that home? Would you awaken what needs to be awakened? Would you uh, draw us to yourself? Father, would you continue to do in us your good work? That which you began that which you see to conclusion, that we might experience your fullness. This would be our heart's desire. So if there's the need this morning for confession and cleansing and and surrender for compliance, I pray, Father, that, that you'd find us responsive to you. In Jesus' name. All right, let's all stand together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever be, we live for you, we live for you, and holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up. My eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. 
Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And I Amen. You guys sound like angels out there. We'll say that. But uh, y'all can be seated for a little bit. We're going to go through some announcements time and all that stuff and get ready for our offering. But a uh, very challenging message from Pastor Dan today, isn't it? Very awesome. Very uh, great to think about what does it mean to respond to God's holiness. And I want to give a challenge to you this week. I want you to think of a way in which you're going to respond to God's holiness this week. Maybe you would look at those, uh, those, uh, those areas or, or motives for responding to God's holiness that we looked at today. And you would pick one as, and, and you would say, this is probably one that I struggle with. I struggle with living in light of the judgment of God. Or I struggle with living in light of the coming glory of God. Or I struggle with living in light of the love of God. And I want to challenge you to not only think about it, but to write it down. Because you know what I've learned? You write some down you're more likely to follow suit with it. So I hope that encourages you this morning. 
On another encouraging note, um, yesterday, uh, New Life had the joy of uh, starting the new pastoral residency uh, this coming for the, this year. And uh, as I was there, looked around, we had about 15 new residents kind of getting loaded up, getting ready to be sent out to plant new locations and getting trained up in that. So that's, a, that's an amazing thing, guys, that God is doing in our church. As uh, Pastor Josiah Job said yesterday, we're not just New Life Hobart. We're a New Life Community Church that meets at Hobart. So we are part of one big body that is doing amazing things in the city of Chicago. So keep praying for that and pray for our area as well. Some other announcements. Uh, as always, please read your bulletin carefully. There's some important information in there regarding uh, name tags, financial updates, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, some intentional things I want to bring to your attention today. Uh, small group started this past week, and who went to small group this week? It was awesome, wasn't it? Crossover young adults, where you at? We had a good time Monday night, amen? And I bring that up because you might think, well, small groups have started, and I guess i got to wait till December or January to join the next things that get loaded up. Nope. You are, trust me, you jump in now, you're not going to miss much. But I'll tell you what you are missing if you don't jump in. You're missing fellowship, you're missing a great time with the Lord's people, and you're missing an opportunity to really, really grow in your faith. So if you are interested in joining a small group, there's uh, sign-up sheets out in the, in the back still and uh, info on where they're meeting and when they're meeting. But uh, really, really want to encourage you to consider uh, jumping in to a small group. Also, this coming Saturday, September 21st, uh, we have uh, the Gospel Bowl coming to our area. It all starts at 12 p.m. And at 1.30, uh, some members of our own band here at New Life Hope are going to be playing at the Gospel Bowl. And there are flyers out there on the table if you are interested in going to that address, times, all that stuff. So I uh, would encourage you to come. It's just, I, I went last year. It's just a great atmosphere of praise in an outdoor environment and, and fellowship with God's people. So I want to encourage you to come on out to that. Also, the, the day after that, uh, Sunday, September 22nd, we have our next New to New Life Visitor Luncheon. So if you've been uh, new to New Life, uh, if you've been coming for a few weeks or months and, and really just have questions about, you know, who are we, what do we do, uh, what, what's this whole uh, campus location model that we're using, what do we mean when we say we're New Life Community Church that meets at Hobart, good opportunity for you to come and, uh, and figure out what all that means. So if you're interested in that, please sign up on your welcome card uh, and let us know that you would be coming so we can plan to uh, feed you because everybody likes free food. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, that's all I have for you. So I just want to uh, call the ushers forward. We're going to pray over our offering, and uh, uh, we'll sing one last song and get on out here and on with our week. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, so much for this time in your house this morning. We do thank you for the message, Lord, and, the, and the, the bold call to live a holy life out of reverence for you. God, that's challenging. That's hard. But, Lord, as Pastor Dan reminded us, you give us the means necessary through your spirit to help us to live a holy life. So, God, we pray that, those, uh, that transformation would take place in our life uh, starting today, starting this very minute, Lord, as we go out of here. We do pray, Lord, that somebody's life will be impacted by us in response to what we heard today. And God, out of response to what we heard today, we also want to give back a portion of what you have already given us. It's all yours, Lord. Every single dollar or dime that we own, it's not really ours. It's yours. It's been stewarded to us. So we want to give back to what you are doing, God. And we pray that you would advance your kingdom through these offerings. God, I also want to pray a special prayer for those who are sick in our congregation, Lord those who perhaps couldn't make it today because they are feeling under the weather or dealing with serious illnesses, Lord, we do pray that you bring healing into their life. We also pray for those, Lord, who are struggling financially, who are struggling to make ends meet with their job or need a better job or have no job right now and are looking for one. We do pray that you, God, would provide and meet every single need that is here today. And we pray for those, God, who are going through other struggles, family struggles, whatever it is, Lord, may you meet us. And may you bring transformation into our lives. We give you all the praise and glory that you're due. We thank you once again for Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross for our behalf, Lord. Thank you that he rose again and that we have hope because of what he did. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand up. i got to say thanks for the first awesome choir practice. Uh, we'll meet back here next Sunday, so uh, let's all sing together. I did hear a few squeaks in the corner. I think it was Rudy in the back. He was squeaking a little bit. We'll fix that next week. So let's all stay in and sing.
Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with a sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Great is your love and justice, God of Jacob. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in a song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough. Heaven reaches out to us. Your grace is enough for me. God, I sing your grace is enough. I'm covered in your love. Your grace is enough for me, for me. Amen, amen. Have a great week. See you next Sunday.